Of course, Matthew chapter 28, very famous chapter. You know, I mentioned already this morning, we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ as in observance today on this Sunday morning, the first day of the week. And you see in the chapter here, as the women were going to, to continue to, to prepare the body and, and make sure that everything was set, at the, just as, they were getting, as, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, the Bible says that he was already gone. He was risen. And, and praise the Lord for that. But I want to point out here a section of this, of this story here in verse number 5. When they get to the tomb and the angel's standing there, and he lets them know that Jesus Christ is risen, he says, uh, And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Now that's very important because he said, Look, he's not here, he's risen. I like how he adds, as he said. He already told you, so it shouldn't be a big surprise. Now, it was a big surprise for all of them. They didn't quite grasp all the things that Jesus was teaching them and saying to them when he was on this earth and teaching how he needed to, to suffer and die and three days later rise again from the dead. But they keep on getting this reinforcement after the fact, just pointing to, hey, Jesus already told you about this. Because they were, there, there was a lot of fear. We're going to notice that he tells them right off the bat, fear not, I know that you seek Jesus. He's not here for he's risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead and behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly. So notice he says, you need to go quickly. And they listened to him and they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. Look at the excitement. Can you imagine the excitement of showing up to the tomb? Now, they're all, I'm sure, still a very heavy heart because Christ was crucified. He was, it, 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 apparently, he would seem to have been defeated, right? He was crucified, was buried, and now they're going mourning and just going to do the duty that they need to do with the body of Christ. And they show up, and there's an angel standing there and tells them, look, look where he lay. He's not there anymore. He's risen just like he said he would. And, and just giving them a new, hey, go spread the news. Go tell the disciples he's risen. He's come back to life. And how exciting that must have been at that moment to walk in and see, wow, what is going on here? And they're kind of shook up. They're a little, they have a little bit of fear. They don't know what's going on. And then they just run. And they run to go tell the news. And this is going to be the focus of my sermon this morning. I think we need to be getting more excited about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and just the good news that that brings. How many people are tr were truly excited when you woke up this morning to actually come to church? I mean, you, don't, you don't have to show your hands. It's fine. Just, just ask yourself this. Oh, sorry. Just ask that to yourself. When you woke up, were you really excited to go to church? Or was it something you're just doing out of obligation? You know, some people come to church because it's Easter. And you say, oh, well, we got to go to church on Easter. Right? Some people go to church because they go to church every week. They go to church whenever the doors open. You know, whatever, whatever your reason is, I want to get into the excitement. Because it is exciting. Jesus Christ, the story of Jesus Christ raising from the dead, hey, that hasn't lost any of the excitement. That's the best news that anybody could ever possibly hear. We need to be getting excited about this. The Bible says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. We ought to be happy to come to church. It shouldn't be a drudgery. It shouldn't be something that you just, oh, well, we got to go again. I'm going to put in my time, just like clocking in and clocking out. I'm here, just, I showed up. Okay, God, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Let's get excited. We need a lot more excitement in the church. And I don't mean this newfangled excitement where we just have this big rock band and everyone's just becoming more like the world and it's just like a nightclub. That's not the kind of excitement I'm talking about this morning. I want the real excitement about the truth, about the good news that we could get excited within ourselves to go out and bring that message of salvation to other people and not to be ashamed of it, but to be able to boldly open up our mouths and preach that truth. Because it's good news. You know, people today were getting brainwashed into thinking that you can't ever talk about religion because it's going to upset people. It's going to offend people. It's a bad thing. Don't talk about that. 
And, and, and it wears on you. And look, we're all human here. And the more you get this from the world, it's going to hit you and hit you and hit you until all of a sudden you realize, you know what, I'm not really saying anything anymore. We need to get that excitement back and get the proper view. The gospel is not a bad thing. Are some people going to get offended? Yeah, you know what, some people will get offended. But how can you worry more about them getting offended than them going to hell? And this is, this is important news. And this is great news. I mean, look, who in the world has, has been dead, crucified, dead, and buried, and put in a tomb, and then all of a sudden, they're gone. They arose from the dead. There's one like that. There's one. Jesus Christ. So they ran quickly from the sepulcher. They, they had great joy and they did run to bring his disciples' word. Verse 9 says, And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. So over and over again in this chapter, you're going to see him saying, Look, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee and there they shall see me. And we need that same message this morning. Don't be afraid. We need to spread the good news of the resurrection of Christ, the great news. It's something to be, have great joy over, to be excited about, to be ready to run out and, and go and tell people about the resurrection of Christ. But we can't be afraid. Fear is going to stifle you. It's going to stop you. It's going to cause you to close your mouth and to sit at home and to not be excited about anything, not to be excited about coming to church, not to be excited about serving God. There's many reasons that we ought to have this great joy this morning about the resurrection of Christ. I'll read for you. Turn if you would to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, right near the end of the Bible. I'm going to read for you from Luke 24, another account of, uh, of the resurrection of Christ. In Luke 24, um, verse 51, the Bible reads, And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. When Jesus Christ departed from them in Luke 24, they had great joy because he was risen from the dead. And then from that point forward, it says they were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3. Bible reads, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our hope and our salvation, it's not a dead hope. We have a lively hope and we ought to act like we have a lively hope because we have a risen state. We have a God that's not like the false gods of the Bible where you remember Dagon who, who was set up when, when the um, Philistines had, had taken the Ark of the Covenant and he was falling down and his head fell off and they were all, you know, it's like their God had died. And he wasn't coming back to life. He couldn't speak. He was just a, a dumb stock, a dumb, a dumb stone, right? A dumb graven image. That's not our God. Our God cannot be defeated. Even when all things seem to be going bad and wrong and, and what in the world is going on, our God can't be defeated. It was all part of his plan. And, and praise the Lord that we have a lively hope because we have a living Savior. Verse number four, to an inheritance uh, incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time wherein ye greatly rejoice though now for a season if need be ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. So he's saying, you know, look, we have a lively hope. We have an inheritance incorruptible. So for all of these reasons, you need to, you need to greatly rejoice even though maybe for a little time right now in your life, you're in heaviness through manifold, through many temptations, through a lot of, a lot of attacks, a lot of things going on. We, we all have problems at various points in our life. Satan's going to be attacking you. Friends and family are going to be attacking you. You're going to be having just bad situations come up, but we can't let that get you down. We need to still be able to rejoice by the lively hope we have and keep focused on the things that we need to keep at the forefront of our minds, which is the heavenly things, the heavenly Jerusalem. And um, it says here in verse 7 that the trial of your faith, our faith is going to be tried. We're going we're to go through those hard times. 
But the trial of our faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. There's always time to rejoice. There's always a cause and a reason to be happy and to go through life. You know, no matter how much pain or, and, and problems that you have in this world, and no matter how difficult things may be for you, we always have a reason to greatly rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory through Jesus Christ here. It says, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We're going to be tried, but let's make sure that we, we hold fast to our faith and don't waver that, when, that we can be found unto praise and honor at the appearing of Jesus Christ. We can be joyful because Jesus was not conquered, as I mentioned earlier. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 6. But in Revelation 1, the Bible reads verse 18, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Jesus Christ conquered death. He conquered hell. He went and, and paid the ultimate sacrifice and punishment for our sins, and he beat it. He says, look, I've got the keys to hell. I've got the keys to death. 1 Corinthians 15. You're still, you go to Romans chapter 6. We're going to spend some time in Romans chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 has a lot to do with the resurrection of Christ, but I don't want to go too much in detail here because we're going to hit that in our Bible study also. Uh, I'll read this for you from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54. The Bible reads, So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? So even in moments, as I mentioned in, during the prayer request time with, with Trudy and her mother passing, if you have Christ as your Savior, as your God, death has no sting. Death has no victory. We have the victory through Christ. Why? Because Christ had the victory. Christ got the, won the victory over death and hell. So if we're in Him, we get to share that victory with Him as He, as he delivers us from the sting of, the, of the death and the, the victory of the grave. There is no victory in the grave. The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, Always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We need to make sure, he says, for this reason, because we have victory over death through Christ, we need to make sure that we stay true, stay faithful, remain steadfast, unmovable, not shaken in your faith. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's something, if you've been coming to this church for a while, if you're new, what we stress here is abounding in the work of the Lord. There's a lot of work for us to do today. You look around and you wonder why the whole world seems to be going to hell, especially this country that was once great, that once actually had morals. It's going to hell. There is a serious attack from Satan, and he's winning. Why? Well, one of the reasons is because Christians have gotten complacent and lazy and stop getting excited about coming to church. Stop getting excited about always abounding and doing the work of the Lord. Hey, we have souls to reach. We've got a lot of work to do. As Jesus Christ said, hey, the field's white unto harvest. And it still is today. We go out sowing and we go out talking to people every week. There's almost always people that are willing to put their faith in Jesus Christ. But the laborers are few. We need more laborers. Pray the Lord of the harvest that, that he'll send forth laborers. We need to reach more people. There's always work. We need to abound in the work of the Lord. But it's not a drudgery. It should be a joyful thing. You know, a lot of people don't get scared at that word work. It's not, it's not something to be afraid of. Okay, It's going to help you. It builds up character. You, you need to work. You need to be able to work hard. You need to be able to keep pushing forward. And I know, look, I'm speaking to a lot of people and I know firsthand have a lot of aches and pains and, and ailments and problems in their life. And, and, I, and I empathize with you. I really do. But we need to all individually be able to, to 
find a way to be able to, to keep focused on, yes, I know things are really difficult right now and kind of hurt, and it's not the best situation I'm in, but I need to keep pressing forward and doing what I can. Now, we all have our own limitations, and I understand that. But you know what they are, and we should all be trying to push ourselves to just exceed that limit to the best of our ability, whatever we can do to, to be praying. If you, if you have problems, if you have physical problems, hey, rest your faith in Christ and, and, and pray unto God for that. As the Apostle Paul did, hey, Apostle Paul said, look, you know, I had, I had a, a thorn in the flesh, a, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. And he had a problem with his flesh, whatever it is, you know, it's debatable whether it's something with his eyes or whatever. He had a problem and he went to God and God says, look, my grace is sufficient for thee. But still keep working. God didn't say, oh, okay, well, you have this problem. Now just, you don't have to do anything. You just retire. You may be able to retire from, from, the, from the physical work that you do, but we should never, ever, ever retire from the spiritual work and the work that we have to do for God. Because if you get to that point, then, then why wouldn't God just take you? Your work here is done. We all ought to have the mentality is that I'm going to keep working and doing what Christ has for me to do every single day of my life. And when he's ready to take me home, when he feels like I'm done with my job, then he could take me. But until that day, I'm going to abound and work for the Lord. You're in Romans chapter 6. Look at verse number 1 of Romans chapter 6. We're going to see the... the Close symbolism for, for baptism in regards to the resurrection of Christ. Of course, what we're showing when we get baptized or when people get baptized is one, their faith in Jesus Christ, but it's showing the resurrection. It's a picture of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why we fully immerse people when we baptize them because you go all the way under the water just like Jesus Christ was buried. And then you come back up. We don't leave you down there. <laughs> this isn't a death cult. We bring you right back up again, showing the resurrection of Jesus Christ as he rose from the dead when you rise out of the water. But let's get some, some good teaching here from Romans chapter 6, verse 1. And I love this verse. It's a little bit of a sidetrack, but I got a little bit of time. It's not going to be a very long sermon this morning. Verse number 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Now, we teach here... That grace is free, 100% free, that the only thing that the Bible requires for you to be saved is to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like Acts 16 says, and they brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Amen. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ has not of works, has nothing to do with how good we are, has nothing to do with how well we obey the commandments, and has nothing to do with whether or not we've repented of all of our sins, because I'll tell you what, if we repent of all of our sins, you're going to be perfect. You'll be living the perfect life. That is not part of salvation. It's something that we ought to be doing daily. Daily dying to sins. Daily mortifying the deeds of the flesh. Daily putting that stuff away. But I'll tell you what, if you truly repent from something, you don't do it anymore. Otherwise, you didn't really repent. And if you need to repent of all of your sins in order to be saved, then you can never sin again in order to be saved, if that's the truth. But it's not the truth. We need to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Stop believing in your false God. Stop not believing in Jesus Christ and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation. And when we preach this, oftentimes people say, well, what are you saying then? Can we just sin? I guess you can just go off and do whatever you want then. Well... Romans chapter 6 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Of course we shouldn't do that. But the implication that, and if you read Romans chapter 5 at the end of the chapter there, he's saying, look, for if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, I'm in verse 19 of chapter 5, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So the Bible teaches us there, look, when sin multiplies, when it abounds, when it just keeps increasing, grace abounds even more to cover all of that sin. Basically saying, can we still sin and be saved? Yes, we can. Because no matter how much we sin, what Jesus Christ did was enough to pay for the punishment, to pay the, uh, uh, the atonement for our sins. 
So it does cover it completely. But should we just, okay, well, have the mindset of, well, okay, well, it doesn't matter now. I'm just going to go off and sin. Of course not. God forbid we would do that. Just because you're a child of God and you know that Christ has paid for your sins doesn't mean we should just go off and, and live like the world. God forbid we would do that. Romans 6, verse 2. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. They're saying just, just like Jesus Christ was dead and buried in the grave, we're buried like that in our baptism. We ought to be leaving this sinful flesh mortified in the grave and walk in newness of life. But notice he says, we should walk in newness of life. He doesn't say you must. We should. Absolutely we should. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. What should we do after that? Hey, we should be walking in newness of life. This is what God expects and demands of us. But it's not like you could lose your salvation if you don't. We should walk in newness of life. He says in verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now this is great news for us. And this is the way we ought to be like, and look, if you're not happy about the things of God, if you're not happy about coming to church, maybe it's because you haven't really crucified your old man. Maybe it's because you haven't mortified the deeds of the flesh. Because I'll tell you what, sin is going to bring sorrow. Sin is going to bring grief. Sin brings death. Sin brings everything that's bad. It, it's, it's not going to cause you to have this joy, the joy unspeakable and full of glory. It's going to bring you down and wear down on you to where you're living a miserable life. Any of those who have been there, I have. I know the misery that sin brings even after my salvation. I got saved when I was 20 years old. I put my faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. I was born again, became a child of God. But I'll tell you what, I didn't just all of a sudden start living for God right away. There was many years where I lived a life of sin. Fornication, drunkenness. And you know what? It was all miserable. I didn't even know what true happiness was. Until you start serving God, until you start doing what's right, until you start getting the sin out of your life, then you even fully realize and can come to understand what joy is. And understand what it's like to go to bed with just a fully clear conscience, knowing that, hey, I, you know, I mean, I know we're not perfect. But when you get rid of these, these major sins of the flesh, and you could just go to sleep just, just with that comfort and knowing that, hey, I, you know, I'm doing what's right. I'm doing, I'm doing what God has laid out for me to do. And it doesn't mean, I'm not saying I've arrived and, there, you know, and there's nothing more to do. No, there's always more to do. And I, oh, it's a constant battle with the flesh. But you get that true joy and contentment of serving God when, when you can mortify and just bury that old dead man. Now, we can never do that completely until Christ comes again. He gives us a new body. We're gonna, you know, or when we pass on, the flesh is left behind. But just as Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead, we have the same exact hope. We see the, the, our own future resurrection through what already happened with him. Christ is the first fruits. And then after that, um, at his coming, there's going to be a resurrection of the dead. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 7, For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. We need to, to reckon ourselves dead to sin. 
and, and just fully realize that just as, just as Christ was dead for those three days and three nights and his body was in the tomb, we need to, to put our sin away and put it away forever so that we don't uh, obey the lusts of sin that reign our mortal body. Let's see, where am I going to return? One more place. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 4. We need to get excited again. I don't know about you, but I'm sick about the I'm sick of these boring churches that, that nothing ever seems to be happening. No souls are getting reached. The work of God just is kind of is stagnant. And look, you're the church. We are the church. The church is not a pastor. The church is not a building. The church is a congregation of believers, people who already believe in Christ. And there are so many churches that are stagnant, that it's just boring, it's not exciting. Let's bring the excitement back. The, the resurrection of Christ is a very exciting story. It's probably the single greatest event to ever happen in the history of mankind. The resurrection from the dead. I mean, there's so many great things. You can think of the birth of Christ. You can think of uh, uh, you know, just creation itself and, and, and so many events that have happened throughout history. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the final, just the, the, the completion of all of the prophecy, of all of the scriptures of Christ, and, and the fact that, that he has completely gotten the victory over sin and of death and hell. Amazing. First, I'll read this for you from 1 Corinthians 15 again. Verse 16, For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. What are you saying there? If the dead doesn't raise, he was talking to the, to the Sadducees that didn't believe in a resurrection. And he explained to them, look, if the dead don't rise from the dead, if they just go in the grave and they don't rise again, he says, you know, your faith is vain. There's no, you know, why would you even say you have faith in Christ if Christ doesn't rise from the dead? If he's just dead and buried and that's where he stays. He says, if the only hope we have in Christ is just in this lifetime while we're here, we're of all men most miserable. Why? Because when you're living for Christ in this life, the Bible says, Yea, and all that live godly shall suffer persecution. If you want to, to actually do something for God and start living for Him in that hope of Christ, you're going to be attacked. You're going to have persecutions. You're going to have hard times. Look at what happened to the, to, to the disciples. They were thrown in prison. They were beat. They were scourged. They had all these problems, problems in this lifetime. But why did they keep doing it? Because their hope wasn't just in this lifetime. They know that there's a resurrection to come. They know that there's going to be a judgment seat of Christ and they know that they're going to receive rewards for, for all the things that they've done in this earth. They know that there's way, something way better coming in the future. They know that there's a resurrection. So they don't care about the, the, the small temporal problems that they might face and the persecutions and the hard times. They endure that. We go through that and we suffer that because we can see the finish line. We can see the end. We know that there's a resurrection just as much as we know that Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. You're in John chapter 4. <clears throat> John chapter 4. This is the excitement I think we need to have. We see here in John chapter 4 a famous story of the woman at the well. Jesus Christ preaches the gospel unto her. And we're not going to read the whole story, but we're going, to, we're going to come in right at the end here. John chapter 4, verse number 25. Because we see what happens and what she does. And I think that we all need to have that type of reaction. Now, I know that I had this reaction after, right after I got saved. But it's easy for this reaction to kind of fade away. We need to keep this new in our life. Look at John 4, verse 25. The woman saith unto him, I know that when Messiah cometh, which is called Christ, when he has come, he will tell us all things. So she's, you know, as she's talking to Jesus, she said, well, we're waiting for the Messiah. We're waiting for Christ. And when he comes, he's, hey, he's going to tell us everything. Look what Jesus says under her, verse 26. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. 
says, I am the Christ. It's me. Verse 27, And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou or why talkest thou with her? Because she was a Samaritan and the Jews didn't have dealings with the Samaritans. So they're kind of wondering, why is he talking to a Samaritan woman? Verse 28, the woman then left her water pot. So she, she's over there. She just went to the well to draw some water. Jesus was sitting there and he's like, hey, give me some water. You know, the whole story. And after speaking to him, he's like, I'm the Christ. She drops what she's doing. She, I, leave her water pot there. She went her way into the city and said to the men, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. So the first thing that she starts doing is starting to tell other people about Jesus. Hey, what I was doing here, that's not important at all. I need to go. I'm going to go run. I'm going to start telling you, hey, isn't this Christ? Come on. Come and see this man. He told me ever I did. Isn't this the Christ? We need to have that excitement to be able to sometimes say, you know, and I know how life gets and it gets really busy. And I had a really busy day yesterday dealing with all the things that come along with owning a vehicle or owning a house and all these chores and things that just could, could distract you. And if you let it happen, they could distract you forever. You have to be able to take the time to break free from those things, to leave the water pot. I know that the, the animals need to be watered. I know that, that we need to be able to cook food. I know that this stuff needs to happen. But there's times where you just need to just drop that and go off and tell people about Jesus Christ. You have to be able to do that. It's too easy to get distracted. We need to have that excitement. Don't dread it. Be excited over it. If you have the excitement, it's going to be a lot easier to drop that water pot because <laughs> carrying the water pot is not that much fun. That's a lot more work. Bending over my car and, and trying to you know, get my hands into places behind the engine, is just, that's not fun. I didn't have a good time with that. I'd much rather be out soul winning than doing that. And it's a lot easier when you have the excitement and the good news to bring forth. It's a lot easier to say, you know what, this can wait till tomorrow. We can do this another day and just go off and, and, and serve the Lord. The woman at the well had great excitement. And she, you know what? She didn't, I just want to point this out too. She didn't have to sit and take any classes on how to preach the gospel. She didn't have to sit in church and make sure, well, let's watch her. I don't know if she really received Christ. I, I, you know, let's watch her and make sure she doesn't sin. Let's watch her and, and, get, you know, and do all this other stuff before we're going to allow her to go and talk to people. You never find that in the Bible. If you know how to get saved, you know how to tell other people how to get saved. It's as simple as that. Now, obviously, we want to be as good as possible at preaching the gospel and knowing as much Bible. And that's all very important. We stress that very much. And we do have soul winning classes. We do try to help you to get better. But everybody's encouraged. If you're saved this morning, you are encouraged to go out and preach the gospel. And whatever capacity you have, I understand some people aren't able to walk very well. You know, we go out and we knock on doors, we go door to door and we talk to people. But that is not the only way that you can preach the gospel. So if you are physically, for whatever reason, incapable of doing that, there are plenty of ways to find a person and talk to them. I know for a fact that everybody that's in this room made it out of their house and got here. So nobody here is just, is just stuck in their house. If you could make it here, you could make it to a grocery store, a park, a house, whatever. There are plenty of places to be able to fulfill the great commission of preaching the gospel to every creature. Now, I encourage you to come and be a part of our door-to-door -door soul winning that we do here. But again, I understand if you can't do that. But we make soul winning as easy as possible for you to be a, a participant of. We have published times that we do every single week without fail, twice a week. But in addition to that, anybody who's interested in coming out sewing, talk to me or talk to others in the church. I will make a point to the best of my ability. I still have a full-time job, so, but, but I, I have some flexibility. If you want to go out and do that and there's a time, these times don't work for you, let me know. I would love to go out and, and preach the gospel with you. And the way that we do it here is, is you know, a lot of people are new to this. They've never done it before and they can be intimidated. We start off, just be a silent partner. We go out two by two. Let, let, let me do the talking. I like to talk. <laughs> That's why I'm the pastor, right? I'm going to talk all day. 
Let me do the talking and learn a little bit and see the scriptures that we turn to and just the way that we, that we present the gospel. It's not that difficult. It really isn't. It's good news. It's something to be excited about. When you're happy about something and you have this gift, how hard can it really be to just, to just tell someone that, hey, there's a free gift. God loves you and he wants you to be saved. And, and he, he did so much for you, so much that his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross. But after he died, that wasn't it. He rose again from the dead. And he paid for your sins. All you got to do is just, just trust him as your savior. Put your faith in him. It's easy. I just did. I just, I just gave you the plan of salvation. Now, you know, when we go out and talk to people, we want to spend as much time as possible to make sure they fully understand that there's no works involved and whatever. But if you could at least just do what I just said, you can, you can share the gospel of Jesus Christ with somebody. It really is that easy. But unfortunately, what happens is we have fear. Turn, if you would, to Mark 16. This is my last point I'm going to make and we're going to be done. Mark 16. Last chapter of the book of Mark. Anybody who's saved that I've ever met or talked to is happy about their salvation. They're truly saved. You're happy about it. You're happy that you're not going to hell. You're happy that Christ paid for your sins. It's definitely a reason to join. But... but not everybody goes out and, and tries to talk to people about it and tries to share that gospel. Actually, very few do. Very few. And the reason why is fear. Look at Mark 16, verse number 7. This is another account. It says, But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Now, these are the women that was being spoken to. They, did, they were excited. They did go and tell the disciples. They did tell the disciples, but they didn't tell anyone else along the way. They, said they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't speak to anyone because they were afraid. They had fear. Fear is what's going to prevent you from opening up your mouth boldly. The opposite of fear is having boldness, Right? And the Bible says that the only, basically, if you read the Bible cover to cover, the only godly fear is fear in God. Fear of the Lord. That is the only fear we ought to have in our life. That's why the Bible says in Revelation 21 8, it says, But the fearful and unbelieving, and the Bible of murders, it gives that whole list, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It's saying, All those sins are worthy of hell. Fearful. Fearfulness, being afraid, is a sin. It's a sin. You may be doing great with your sin life and getting other sins out of your life. You say, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I've never, I don't rob people, I do all these things. And praise the Lord for that. I'm happy for that. And you should continue to work at that. But if you have the sin of fearfulness and that's keeping you from, from preaching the gospel, work on that sin. We need to overcome that. Get the boldness through the Holy Ghost. Pray to God for boldness. The Apostle Paul, when he was sitting in a jail cell, says, pray for me that I might have boldness to preach the gospel. He was already thrown in prison for preaching the gospel, and he's asking, I need more boldness. Nobody in this room that I know of has ever been thrown into prison for preaching the gospel. But the Apostle Paul continued to ask for boldness. We have the, like, one of the best opportunities in history history to reach people with the gospel of Christ. Don't waste it. It is not illegal to go door to door and to talk to people and preach the gospel. It, you don't really suffer that much persecution in general when you go out and do this stuff today in 2016. Times are changing, my friend, and it's going to be difficult again. But if you can't do it now when it's easy, how in the world are you going to be able to do it when it's much more difficult? We need to be able to open up our mouths and boldly speak. In 2 Corinthians 4.13, the Bible says, We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. If you're a believer this morning, you ought to be able to speak and tell other people that you're a believer also. Let's get excited, man. I love I love celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ this Sunday. It's exciting. Let's bring that good news 
to other people. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the sacrifice that you made for us, dear Lord, for everything involved in, in the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, dear Lord. We thank you for loving us and caring us so much to put so much thought towards us and, and to go through everything that you've gone through, dear Lord, for sinners, for wicked sinners like ourselves. Lord, it's a love that is so amazing that we can't even fully reciprocate, dear Lord. But I pray, I pray that you would please help us to have the boldness, to have the excitement, to, to, to have the joy that comes with your love and the sacrifice that you made and our own salvation, that you would help stir up our souls, stir up our spirit, dear God, today to want to preach the gospel to the lost. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.